I would like to introduce you all and uh, have you make welcome our presenter tonight, Don Teeter. Thank you. Uh, it's kind of interesting to hear yourself described as an expert. I, I guess things like that just sort of happen gradually. My dad was in the automobile business for over 60 years, and one of his old high school buddies was in the building uh, supply industry until just a few years ago. And he told me one time when we were sitting around at deer camp that what it took to be an expert is to be 100 miles from home and have a leather briefcase. <laughs> so I do qualify if that's the criteria. I can actually see easier without my glasses. I'm normally used to having a microphone that I can clip on and walk around the room, so, but I'll try to stay close enough to this so that you'll be able to hear me. And we're going to allow some time toward the end of the program for questions, but if there's a particularly relevant question that you have as we go through things, I'd be happy to you know, have you holler out my name or dance around or something to catch my attention and I can try and deal with the question you know, to a reasonable extent while we're progressing. Certainly in a program of this length, we can do very little except scratch the surface, kind of introduce things. I was just reading uh, this evening, right before I came over, a couple of articles that had been in the newsletter here dealing with beads, and both of those pieces were pretty good in terms of introducing some phrases. You can't really get, get into enough detail in a short period of time to allow somebody to attend something brief and become an expert, but hopefully what you can do is encourage people to be able to try to satisfy their curiosity and to learn. But really, that's what research is all about, is learning. I became a surveyor by accident. I was a history and political science major in college, even went to American University my junior year for what they called the Washington Semester Program, an honors program in history and political science. It was my goal since the eighth grade to be a lawyer. And I'd even been admitted to WVU Law School. I was scheduled to take the law school admissions test. And I discovered, now this is in my senior year of college, after I wanted to be a lawyer since the eighth grade, and somebody told me you had to wear a tie in class at WVU Law School. And I was like, oh man, I don't know if I can do that. It wasn't everything, but in a way it was kind of the symbol of it all. And I actually consider myself very fortunate uh, my wife might not agree when she looks at our mortgage payments and all of those things that uh, I'm fortunate not to be a lawyer. But if good fortune means discovering a line of work that matches your interest and that you can enjoy doing, then I'm fortunate. I had a job my first year out of college, obviously with a degree in history and political science and no education courses you're not too well equipped for the job market. But I got a pretty good position at the time, this was 1974, and I got hired on a place at a dollar an hour and all the beer I could drink. That worked out pretty good in the first year out of college. And then, it's now my, uh, my next youngest brother's now ex-father-in-law was a forester that had a big surveying contract when they were first building snowshoe skiers. And they offered me $2.50 an hour, no beer, but that still wasn't too bad. And it's just one of those serendipitous things where surveying is something that I slid into pretty easily. I enjoyed the work, a great deal of which is outdoors, but an integral part of surveying is research. And research is something that I had enjoyed from the time I understood even what research was. Uh, shortly after I got out of college, I worked on this book, which was published in 1977. My grandfather grew up in Whitmer. He spent about the first 14 years of his life there. And whenever I was a, a teenager, he bought an empty mobile home frame and built on that a replica of a railroad passenger car. And inside that, built models of the towns of Whitmer and Norton, the way they were in the age of steam when he grew up there. It was always a real special place to him, and I suggested to him that we could do a history, and 
he paid me minimum wage for about a year and financed the first printing of the book. It took me 35 years to get it reprinted. I do have copies available now. It's unchanged from the original edition other than it now has an index. Certainly an index is something that's useful in your publication. Any of you who have done much research know that a lot of times one of the first things you reach for when you're looking at a book to see if it's relevant is to see if there's an index. From my perspective over the years, people would say, well, I had an uncle over in that area, or an aunt, or whatever. Are they in there? And I'd have to respond, you know, I don't really know. I only wrote the book. I didn't memorize it. <laughs> and any of you that have written know how you can't keep it all in your head. That's why we write things down. And that's actually a very important part of research. We also see people doing research, and they're trying to carry it in their head. Or they've got little scraps of paper. The first key thing is to be organized in your research. Because it doesn't do any good to know that you have some information if you can't put your hands on it. Now, I'm beginning to make the adjustment to today's world that there are times that instead of trying to find that hard copy that I know I have somewhere in my files, go to my computer, and the odds are I can find it more quickly. And a computer is a great thing for organizing your information. Of course, we can't even talk about what a great leap forward it is with writing to be able to cut and paste and all of those kinds of things. I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about land grants. A lot of you are probably aware of SIMS Index. I'm sure there's a copy probably somewhere in this room. Uh, it's an index to all of the land grants in West Virginia. There is also a small <coughs> supplement to it. Uh, 1952, the original was published, and then this supplement uh, just within a year or two after that, I believe, a few grants that were missed. This was actually quite a project. Because these were Virginia land grants. And when the state of West Virginia <coughs> split off, suddenly they were without the records that related to the property within the state. And initially, West Virginia demanded from the Virginia land office that they turn over all land grants that were for property in West Virginia. Well, it was somewhat problematic. The Virginia land office saw their duty as preserving those records, and rightfully so. Uh, any of you ever been to the archives over in Richmond? It, it is a very impressive collection. They have done an excellent job of not just maintaining and preserving those records, but also making them available to the public. And if you want a copy, say, of a map, I have a couple of examples over here. Um, the one on the far end over there came from the uh, University of Virginia Library, uh, the Hotchkiss map of the Upper Taggart Valley. The other one is what's called the Nine Sheep Map of Virginia. I'll talk about it a little later. It came from the Library of Virginia. At the Library of Virginia now, if you want a copy of a map, if it has already been scanned, then all you have to do is pay to burn it to the DVD. If it has not been scanned, you have to pay a scanning fee. Starts at about $30 and sort of advances from there depending upon how big the map is. It's just one of those things where you have to do your part. And I know I have the perspective that there have been times that I was there and I spent $300 getting copies of things, digital copies. And of course, the wonderful thing about a digital copy is you're on one copy, it doesn't matter. You can print another. You can also crop things out. We'll see some of that in, in my handout material here in, in the PowerPoint. Every time I've got those copies and say it is $300, you can always see them look up with kind of a little cringe because they're used to people jumping on them. You know, this is public information. You know, I'm entitled to it. I'm a taxpayer. All of that kind of thing. And the people tend to think the same thing about that archive that they do about this one. Is that they're just sitting here and the state money's just washing over. <laughs> funding all of their pet projects. Of course, I can tell that everybody that works here knows it doesn't work that way. So in that kind of situation, I don't mind doing my part. It does help that because this is my business, uh, not just surveying, but also historic presentations and seminars for surveyors, that at least it's a tax-deductible expense. 
What Sims Index has is the list of all the grants which copies were made of by Virginia for West Virginia. Now, some of those grants sprawl across the state line. They're indexed by county. A key thing to remember is the county that the property is in now is not necessarily the same county it was in when the grant was made. Um, a few years ago, Surveyors Historical Society, actually, yeah, just two years ago uh, last fall, had our annual surveyors rendezvous in Webster County at uh, Camp Caesar. Some of you may be familiar with the area. We were working on a thing called the dividing line. It was a boundary line that was the boundary between Greenbrier County and Harrison County. It ran from what is now Bath County, Virginia, all the way to the Ohio River. At the Washington Bottom, where the Washington Works <coughs> is, that's uh, the, the DuPont plant. And that line was run in, I believe, 1786. A young man named uh, Thomas Douglas, he apparently didn't live too long after that. What attracted our attention to that line was the fact that over the course of the number of years, surveyors working across the central portion of the state had discovered that within 10 years of the running of that line, there were two different versions of the line as much as 1,500 to 1,800 feet apart. And indeed, even today, sometimes you can do deed research in Braxton County, and you'll find references to points being in the North County line or the South County line that was only supposed to be one county line. That's what attracted us to the study of that particular issue. It was an interesting uh, exercise. And there are a number of places where we collected GPS positions on corners or boundary evidence that had the reputation of being on that. <coughs> it was an interesting thing. But the key to us to transfer it into being an educational opportunity was the opportunity to see that a straight line is not always a straight line. And that's a real eye-opener for some people, uh, particularly uninformed members of the public, some uninformed members of the legal profession, and unfortunately, some uninformed surveyors. I actually had a surveyor say to me a couple of months ago that he had been in a seminar a number of years ago where the speaker had said, once a straight line, always a straight line. And he tried to adhere to that. That's not necessarily always the case. In some situations, a land grant line, especially if the land grant is for many thousands of acres. The lines, some of them may have been a mile, two miles long. And later, other properties were either split out of that grant or tied into that grant, the lines of which were very vaguely marked, and maybe they didn't get them right on that straight line. But over a period of years, a straight line can become crooked because of usage and the actions of the parties. Now, a prime example, and I don't have time to go into this certainly in detail. It's a whole seminar subject. Another surveyor from Harrisonburg, Virginia, uh, Dave Ingram and I do a presentation on the Deacons line. We start with a discussion of the Fairfax line and the Fairfax line. Now, probably a lot of you are familiar with the Fairfax line, at least in passing. That was a 76 mile line, started over east of Blue Ray, Virginia, over on the east side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, and ran up to the corner of Grant and Preston and Tucker counties up near the Maryland boundary. Not right on the Maryland boundary because there's a funny little loop in the river there. But the Fairfax stone itself has been accepted for a long time. In 1788, a man named Francis Deacons surveyed a number of land grants for Maryland and for West Virginia. Some of those grants he and his brother actually got the grants. There's some question as to whether or not he ever ran it as a continuous line but at least it had that reputation. A straight due north line from the Fairfax Stone about 37 miles to the Mason-Dixon. It didn't take too long before it was discovered that the line was neither straight nor absolutely true magnetic. And it very quickly became clear to Maryland that it was to their detriment. There was an attempt in 1859 to settle that question. A fellow named Nathaniel Mishler was later a pretty prominent mapper during the Civil War, was hired by the two states to survey 
the line as it was originally described. And he did so. He found the Fairfax Stone at the northwest end of the line. He ran an astronomic north line until he hit the Mason-Dixon line. And his work was so good in 1859 that when the survey was remade in 1912 at the order of the state of U.S. Supreme Court, they found that their data and his data only differed by about five or six feet when it hit the Mason-Dixon line. Well, a difference of five or six feet in 37 miles of line is pretty insignificant. There was a pie wedge, three quarters of a mile at the Mason-Dixon line, running down to a point at the Fairfax Stone. Now, there's a lot of other issues, too. Maryland wanted to go to the Potomac Stone even further west. But the Supreme Court ruled that a lot of the original land grants had called for their easternmost boundary to be the Deacon's Line. And not just the Deacon's Line, but also to be the Maryland Line, very specifically the Maryland Line. West Virginia won the lawsuit that was brought by Maryland. West Virginia won the territory. And the Supreme Court ruled that what counted was the actions of the parties and the way the people had treated the boundary over the years. In other words, where they had thought it was and had treated it as the boundary had become the boundary. Schools had been built, roads had been built, taxes had been collected, and Maryland had not done that, but Virginia and then West Virginia had. The Deacon's Line now not only is not due north, it was originally run magnetic. It's about three degrees off of due north. There are also bends in the line, and there are some places where there are actually jogs in the line of as much as 800 feet, a line that was originally described as being a straight line. And it all hinged on the question coming before the Supreme Court of where the line had originally been surveyed and what the people along the line had treated as being the boundary. A very similar issue has been raised with the southern boundary of Colorado. Uh, some of you have probably heard news reports occasionally that the, the Four Corners Monument, probably the most famous corner in the country, is actually 2,500 feet off. It's not off. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. It's 2,500 feet from the geodetically defined position that the original surveyor was told to place it in. That surveyor did not have the technology we have today. He didn't have GPS. He went out there with the best ephemeris data, that's the, the astronomic data, the best equipment, the best mathematical training available at the time. And something like a quarter mile off was actually pretty darn tight for the time the work was first done. The Four Corners Monument's exactly where it's supposed to be because Boundaries are supposed to stay where they're originally put, not where they were intended to be. <laughs> so anytime you're looking at a land grant, don't take it too literally. Now they can be a valuable source of information. Uh, you can plot them up and a lot of times it's good to do that at the topographic map scale. Frequently there will be natural monument calls, ridges or streams, uh, sometimes a road that can allow you to place that land grant onto a topographical map. That can be very interesting for a genealogist or a historian because a big part of doing genealogy is trying to get connected. You know, not just connected to history and connected to the past, but connected to a place on Earth. You know, we, we all feel that, probably the group here more so than many people. Uh, I know I've seen the phenomena, and I'm sure a lot of you have, when I was graduating from high school, there were a whole slew of my classmates that were saying, I can't wait to get out of this hole. I'm going to get out of here and I'm never going to come back. And now there's a whole slew of those same people are trying to find a way to get back here because it's home. And part of that is the thing where we all go through, we think there's some other wonderful place in the world. Very few of us recognize at an early age that maybe we are already in a pretty good place. But over the course of time, home has its draw. And the land is the real connection to home. That's what really drags us in. My sister, she's uh, eight years younger than me, has lived in Orlando, Florida. 
since the late 1970s. Um, she met her husband down there. He's from his family originally from Ohio, and uh, they were kind of refugees to Florida, I guess you'd say it, or escapees. I don't know. But my nephew, who's just now started the college on a golf scholarship at Jacksonville State, when he was about two years or in the second grade. His teacher was having a kind of cultural diversity day at school. Well, the, my brother-in-law's name is Petronio. It's not too difficult to figure out the ethnic background there. And the teacher thought she had a pretty easy one there to get the discussion going. Now, like I say, Joey was born in Orlando, has lived there his entire life up till then and still right up till now. But the teacher says, Joey, your name's Petronio. Does that mean you're Italian? Well, Joey says, no, I'm from West Virginia. <laughs> so that tie to the home country can be there, even to the generations that were not actually living here. You know, we have West Virginians scattered all over the country. That's what has a lot to do with the success of things like Golden Seal Magazine. They don't just necessarily take people back to where they themselves are from. They take them back to the land and the stories that they heard from their parents and their grandparents and give them that connection, that connection to the ground. Now, now you may find that I kind of wander around in the discussion a little bit. I just mentioned when I came in, I just put this handout and this PowerPoint presentation together yesterday. And there has been no rehearsal. I just kind of turned <laughs> loose. And there was a time when I first started doing presentations that I worked from a tighter script. Uh, but that's not the case anymore. Uh, all, all I need is a little something to work off of and I'll fill your time. The land grants are now available online. They're also available in this building. The books that used to be in the state auditor's office, they're indexed by county. They match the indexing numbers that are in Sims Index. They're upstairs here. You can get prints of them. But quite frankly, it's easier to go to the Library of Virginia and get them online. And I just tried yesterday the instructions that I have in the second paragraph of the, uh, the handout. Now, the numbers, the book and page numbers in the Library of Virginia listing are not the same as in Sims Index. But if you look at Sims Index first, you can often know the general physical location of the property, the, the creek or drainage that it was on, the year that the grant was made, the number of acres. And that can help you in going to an alphabetical index then online. I'm not going to go through the details, but you get the URL link, you can bring the thing right up. Now it used to be, it came up in a TIFF that was a little hard to manipulate. And if you printed it directly, it ended up with a lot of black, black space around it, you know, real ink hungry. I think they've changed that so that you can actually edit it right there on the screen. But what I used to do is I'd save the TIFF, convert it to a PDF, and then open the PDF up and save that as a JPEG, just so I could crop it and get rid of all that extra black space in there. Said, I'm, I'm kind of a babe in the woods with PowerPoint, but as I mentioned earlier today, it's getting so that audiences simply expect PowerPoint. They expect graphics to be up front here. Uh, with a younger audience, not so much of a problem here this evening, in particular, I think they have retrained their minds that they really can't absorb a subject unless you do have those graphics up there on the screen for them. An interesting uh, kind of research that can be aided by land grants. I don't know if any of you have read the work of Stephen and Kim McBride. They're both from West Virginia. They're both uh, professors in Kentucky. They're archaeologists. They've done a good bit of work in Pocahontas County over the last all eight or ten years excavating old fort sites. And one of the things they have done to pin down their search areas is plot up land grant records because a lot of the information sources indicate whose property the fort was on. And by going to the land grants 
and getting those and plotting them up and putting them in context, they can narrow down their search area and they've been very successful in finding some of those old fort sites. And in a lot of ways, their research and work has changed our image of the frontier forts in West Virginia. In particular, I believe it's Arbuckle's Fort in Greenbrier County, although it was more of a regular military fort than just a local little thing. I can remember being told when I was in school that there were no stockade type, traditional type forts in West Virginia. Well, that's what they found at Arbuckle's Fort. And all we supposedly had was blockhouses. Well, maybe that's the tradition that I carry forward, but the reality is there was another type of fort found on the frontier. And of course, West Virginia, at the time the first land grants were being made, was on the frontier. The uh, Indian raids were happening in this area as late as the early 1780s. They were pretty sporadic. Um, still was just as serious as it was your house they raided. And of course, in the early periods of the settlement of this area, there's the stories like the um, Mary Angels Draper story. Probably some of you familiar with that. Uh, the uh, pretty good book, Follow the River. There was a TV movie made, but it, there's a good movie in that book, but it's not the TV movie that they made. Not a bad movie, uh, particularly from a historian's perspective. But you know, what a story. You know, coming right through this area, at least theoretically, Mary Ingalls Draper and the old German woman she escaped with were probably on their escape route walking within a couple of hundred yards or less of where we're standing right now because the only way they knew to get back home was to follow the river. They had no maps. There were no well-marked trails. That's one of the things that it's hard for people today to adjust to. I do a whole seminar on Civil War survey, and one of the prominent features of a lot of the maps from that time period are houses are shown with the people's names or little crossroads, the name of the store or the church or the school, there were no route numbers. There were no route signs. You depended upon knowledge to get you somewhere. Now the one other thing I'll mention with the land grants is that the land grants do not have the plats with them. Of course the plat is kind of the holy grail because the plat's the graphical representation and calls in a deed or a land grant are subject to error. It happens through transcription. It happens through just plain old blunders. It still happens today, it's just not as frequently. Uh, some of the ones we have are kind of amusing, and spell check doesn't catch them. Um, I have one I probably shouldn't, shouldn't say out loud to the whole group, but maybe I'll share it later with some of you. <clears throat> there, there's a number of them. So that's a key thing to remember anytime you're interpreting deeds, or land grants. They do not necessarily mean what they say. For one thing with a deed, somebody can't convey to you land that they don't own, even though they may honestly think they own. Now generally speaking, in a deed, you have grantors, that's the sellers or the first parties. You have the grantees, that's the buyers or the second parties. There can be things like a third party in a deed, sometimes there's a kind of a transition across generations where a deed will be made from the grandfather to the son, but then also to the heirs of the son, so that the son's really only holding the property kind of in trust for his own offspring. And you just have to carefully read the, the clauses and phrases in the deed to interpret those kinds of things. Now, wills themselves are a thing that we don't make a whole lot of use of sometimes in boundary research, but can be very useful at critical times. West Virginia is one of those places where a lot of times property passed over various generations without a deed ever being involved. And a will can be your only clue as to how that carried forward. There also can be death, birth, death, and marriage records. When you have intestacy, as somebody dies without a will, the laws of the state rule how the heirs inherit the property. If a married woman inherited property from her father, you've got a different last name. And that's not always easy to bridge the gap on that in indexing. That's where birth, death, and marriage records can be useful. 
If you have the name of the person you followed it back to, you can try looking at a marriage record, and in the marriage record, it's going to tell you who the parents were of the bride and the groom. Or a death record, a lot of times, will also give you that kind of information. You can use the birth record then sometimes to also kind of carry things back. There's no hard and fast rule on how to do these things. It's a matter of you keep plugging away at it. And there are times. You know, research does not always happen in a nice, even, straight line. It's not as easy as it seems like it could be. There's times you'll go to the record room, you'll breeze right through things, and you'll accomplish a lot. And there's other days you go there and you spend four or five hours and you feel like all you've done is spend your years. And any of you that have done some genealogy research, I'm sure you've run into that thing uh, to the extent where there's times where when you suddenly make a discovery after putting all those hours in, you're like, oh, okay, it was worth it. We accomplished something. Even when you don't find anything, you're accomplishing something. You're making a diligent search and you're eliminating possibilities. And sometimes eliminating possibilities is a big part of what research is about. It's not just a matter of what you find, it's the finding whatever is there. In the boundary surveying context, there's times when we're out there scratching around in the ground and kicking at the rocks and walking around in a circle and scratching our heads and a client's looking at us and saying, man, those guys are just over there goofing off. I'm paying them big money. But we're not goofing off. We're looking for the boundary evidence. And sometimes that's a tough search. And a lot of times we're searching for it not because we expect to find it, but because we want to be able to say we made a diligent effort to find it. Sometimes it pays off. Sometimes it doesn't. As a surveyor, there's nothing more embarrassing than looking for a corner saying it's not there, and then two years later somebody else comes back and says, how did you miss that? Well, you can get the same feeling as a researcher or a genealogist. You can get blinders on that can keep you from seeing a little aha moment sometimes, and then somebody else says, well, you were aware of this document, weren't you? Well, I wasn't before, but I guess now I am. Land books are another thing that are sometimes useful. What the land book is, is a listing of all the properties in each county for each year. Now, a lot of times they're divided into districts, but it's not the same as the magisterial districts we're used to seeing. It's just the different uh, districts of the, the guys that were actually doing the assessment. In Randolph County, normally speaking, uh, which is my home county, usually there were two districts, but we had about seven magisterial districts. So it's really two different things there, but they're generally speaking is then a further division of the same district names that we're used to see. Now the land book doesn't prove a thing about who owns property. I don't understand the oil and gas people, the great divine state pays on the land books. All the land book proves is that somebody was assessed with that piece of property and paid taxes on it. Does paying taxes prove that you own a piece of property? Absolutely not. The county's more than happy to take the taxes. And I've known more than one case where I looked at things for a client. In one case, they had been paying taxes on the property for nearly 100 years, and the property did not exist. That can sometimes happen. It can happen with property because of confusion. In that particular case, a 13-acre tract was sold out of a 35-acre tract. There was a description recorded with the deed. The calls in that description were pretty sketchy. Well, then a couple of years later, before the first deed was even recorded, they sold the rest of the property to the same people, and they recorded that deed. But the description in it was sketchy enough that somebody realized you need that 13-acre description to be able to make sense out of the 34-acre description. So they went to the courthouse and recorded the deed. So now what happens? These people's predecessor and title have the deed for the 35 acres that includes the 13 acres, but when the 13 acre deed came in, it was put on the land books as though it was a separate piece. So for 100 years, they paid taxes on that 13 acres as a separate parcel and also as part of the 35 acre parcel. 
And eventually we got all that straightened out and they got it off the books. Now obviously when property taxes were real low, it didn't make much difference and it didn't uh, behoove you to spend a lot of money trying to resolve those kinds of problems. We have somewhat the same issue sometimes with uh, tax sales now. I worked on a piece of property, well actually a non-existent piece of property in Fayette County. A fellow had sold pieces out of his 30 acres over the years and each year the assessor would subtract the property sold and then would assess him for the remainder. Well when he sold the last three acres there was nothing left but on paper there was two acres left. Now he knew he didn't own anything. The first year he went to the assessor and he said you need to take that off the land book because I don't own anything there anymore. The assessor wouldn't do it. He paid the taxes the first year. The next year, he said, the heck with it. I don't care what they do with it because I know I don't own anything. It went up for bid at the tax sale. Everybody in the neighborhood knew there was no property there. They all knew old Fred had sold everything, so nobody bid it. That was in the 30s. Then in the early 70s, they got a new commissioner of delinquent and forfeited lands. That's who's in charge of the tax sales. A gung-ho young attorney, I would say. And he gathered up all the different titles that had been referred to as sold to the state. Now what sold to the state means in a tax sale context is that nobody was willing to take a chance on that piece of property. Either they didn't know about it or maybe they did know about it. So he sold it at the tax sale. Well the guy he sold it to kept it for three or four years. He couldn't find it. He let it go for taxes again. And then in the late 80s, they finally got somebody to bid on it again, and that guy was my client. He hired me. He wanted me to go out there and survey his two acres so he could run those other people off his property. Well, it didn't work that way. I ended up charging him nearly $1,000 to tell him that he had bought a worthless piece of paper. There's no guarantee to tax it. Now, I have seen other situations where people got a very good piece of property through a tax sale. Sometimes... The heirs to a piece of property have just kind of lost track of things over the years or the line has kind of fizzled out and they're unable to find heirs. And even if the heirs are identified, if the taxes aren't paid sooner or later, it will go up for tax sale. But what you're buying in a tax sale is a piece of title. And the title itself may theoretically be good, but that does not necessarily mean it attaches to any piece of property. It's kind of one of those little uh, warning notes there. Now, circuit court records, the chancery suits, that, that's one person sues another, that's in, generally speaking the chancery books. Lands that are ordered sold because of a lawsuit, there will be some sort of a record in the chancery records, uh, not just the books but often case files, and the partitions of estates. And a lot of times I'll find plaques showing a partition 100, 150 years ago, it can be very useful. Some counties are pretty good about this, others not so good. We're standing in one of the not so good counties right now. I have found probably 75% of the plats that I have looked for in the circuit court records of Randolph County. In Marion County, I have found 99% of them. The records are well maintained, they're properly indexed, they're taken care of. In Kanawha County, and I just experienced this within the last three weeks. They swear such records don't even exist. <laughs> of course, they won't let you pass the glass partition to begin with. I was looking for a case file from 1855. I know the case file is somewhere in their records. I know there was a partition plat in that case file. And I needed that partition plat to determine where the old Giles Fad and Kanawha Turnpike. Well, they took down the information. Initially, they said, oh, we don't have anything more than 30 or 40 years old. I thought, well, then some circuit clerk's been guilty of a violation of the law, destroying the records. They're in a basement somewhere, and they don't have enough interest to even allow me to go look where the records are stored. I'm not sure what the solution to that is. I guess if it gets bad enough, I'll have to sick the lawyers that I'm working for on them. They might pay a little more attention to them or perhaps a state legislator, you know, that, that might get their attention. I, I ran into the same problem trying to find the county court order books or minute books, the proceedings of every county court. 
They swear they don't have those either. Oh, 1870. That's, that's an awful long time ago. Is 1870 a long time ago for a researcher or a genealogist? Yeah, that's just a hop, skip, and a jump. Maybe just a hop and a skip and not even the jump. But enough of picking on Canola County. Uh, I, I could be even handed. I've never found a plant I've looked for in Webster County. And it's not because the records aren't there. They're there. They're just not in order. Neither chronologically nor alphabetically. And they'll let you root through them if you want. But you're not going to find much. Then there's also the, uh, the situation I ran into one time in Webster County where they sometimes will allow an attorney to check out one of the case files. Well, there was one that then the guy signed the card for, you know, an attorney there in Webster Springs. Now, I'm sure he means to bring it back one of these days, but he's had it since 1935. <laughs> it may turn up. Now, tax maps is another one of those things that's kind of a sore point with surveyors. Tax maps look good, especially now that a lot of times a tax map is based upon a GIS. Oh, it's all in the computer. It doesn't get any better than that. Well, I remember when computers first came around, they had that thing G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. Tax maps did not exist in West Virginia until about 50, 60 years ago. And they hired contractors to create the tax maps based upon the deed records and aerial photographs. Now, if any of you have ever looked at a vague description in a deed, no, I give to my son, Joe, the lower end of my farm, beginning where the road crosses the creek, thence up past the rock pile in the field to the watering trough, and around the brush pile behind the barn, down by the apple orchard, and back down the road to the beginning. No barriers, no distances. You know, nothing specific to pin that thing down. And the tax mappers had to work with things like that to create the tax maps. It's amazing how good a job they did in some cases. In other cases, you can understand why they didn't do any better than they did. They, um, and those tax maps are constantly being updated, upgraded, but they're not very useful a lot of times for the kind of research most of you would be doing because they reflect the current ownership. And the old properties that were many more acres generally would have been split up and it would be hard to identify those old track lines on the tax maps. Now in a situation where it's a rural area, particularly with a lot of woods, that hasn't been split much, you may see a historic configuration on the tax maps. But even then, it's still subject to a good bit of error. I have had landowners slap a tax map down in front of me. Now here's the official government map of my property. In the one case, the client said, and it shows that I own down to that road and I can't accept any less. I had to inform him that as a surveyor, I can't give you that because somebody else owns it. I'm dealing with a client right now. He's now the official top of the list of the clients from the dark side. <laughs> I refuse to put the boundary where he wanted it to be because he has an erroneous idea based upon a transcription error in a deed of where his boundary should be, completely in conflict with all the other evidence in the record and on the ground. But he's suing me because he says, quote, uh, this man has crooked me out of my lane. <laughs> I'm hoping the judge will inform him that when you hire a professional for advice, you can't sue them because you don't like their advice. <laughs> you know, it's like you went to the doctor and the doctor says, you have cancer. He said, I don't have cancer, and I'm going to sue you for saying so. <laughs> didn't do a thing to cure the cancer. You know, I didn't cause the man's problem. And he keeps falling back on the thing that you have to go by that deed because the judge ordered him to write that deed. It was in a foreclosure case. doesn't matter if the judge ordered him to write that deed. There's transcription errors in it, and the transcription errors are what are leading him astray. It also contains a clause being the same property as... And you can follow the deed record on back, and there will be the correct cause. And that brings up an important point. When you're researching deeds, you do not know if you have the correct cause unless you have the original split. 
what we call the deed coming from the common grantor. The first time the line was created, then at least theoretically you have the correct information. Sometimes corrections have been made later. The one example that I've used a number of times is I was working on a piece of property in southern Randolph County, and an outsale of about 75 acres had been made from a tract of several thousand. The calls came down big run and had the, the phrase with the meanders, which means if the stream moves a little, the boundary moves with it. There's a several hour discussion we could have on that too. But in this particular case, big run's almost like a gorge. It's very easy to follow those meander calls down. But then you get down to where the hollow opens up and it says going to a beach on a branch. Is this what a side stream or a slough or what? And then it says that it has bearings and distances, thence with the branch. I couldn't get any of that to work on the ground. And the fact that there were two or three different colors of paint spread all over the place indicated I wasn't the first surveyor to get confused at. <laughs> so I went back and completed the research, which I should have done to begin with before going to the field. The original split to a beach on a bench, thence with the bench, now fit. There was a little terrace there, just like the river terraces in the Canal Valley on a you know, much smaller scale. And the calls for with the bench followed right around the foot of the hill, right at the edge of that flat. But without that information, I couldn't put it on the ground. And in interpreting a deed, you know, whether for genealogical research or your own purposes today, those are the kind of issues you have to deal with sometimes. All right, I talked a little bit about historic maps. Now, there are a number of maps right here in this building. They're available for you to look at. Copies can be obtained. They're also available from a lot of other sources in West Virginia and Virginia. And, of course, so much of our record is in Virginia because it was only that hop, skip, and jump ago that we were part of Virginia. And our records are still part of their records. The map over on the far side there is the Jedediah Hotchkiss map of the Upper Taggart Valley. He made that map in 1861. He was assisted by a local surveyor named Jacob Conrad. It says on the caption that it was drawn from Jacob Conrad's memory. Jacob Conrad covered a lot of ground. This was his last job. He died of dysentery shortly afterwards. Uh, Jed Hotchkiss himself went home to Churchville, Virginia and spent the winter recovering from dysentery. He was at Valley Mountain with General Lee in that campaign in the fall of 1861. The map itself is a, a very impressive document. Uh, I'll look at a detail from it here in a few minutes. We also have university collections. That map came not from the State Archives, but from the Library of Virginia, or the University of Virginia Library. Now the other map here, the nine sheet map of Virginia, came from the Virginia State Library, sort of the comparable agency to what we have here. They had voluminous records, uh, including records of all of the turnpikes that were built before the Civil War, often including field notes. A lot of times those field notes include a sketch page that shows who lived along the proposed route of the turnpike. In a lot of cases I've taken those field notes, plotted them up, and got them to fit a road on the ground. And there could be information there regarding the people that lived along the turnpike. You need to be very specific about what you're looking for. They have the originals of those field notes in Richmond. They have microfilm copies at the Department of Highways. You have them here. You have the microfilm copies here. I was not aware of that. I'll have to look at that. They've been very, very helpful to me um, at the DOH. And actually, they also obtain uh, digital copies sometimes for me of road plans, part of putting things into context. And university collections is hit or miss. There's the only necessary reason is that somebody's willing to donate it to the collection and they're willing to take it. And most archives, the general idea is unless we can see a compelling reason not to take it, we're going to accept it. You can't always tell what's going to be important in the future. Some public libraries hold a small or even large collections, and a lot of college libraries have collections that can be useful. That's the kind of thing where you just have to get familiar with the different things. Don't be afraid to go and ask for help. 
one of the, the biggest things that it did for me when I worked on this book back in the late 1970s was I was not too good at asserting myself. And there was a, a document that's the, the precursor to the Poor's Index that's still published today, a listing of companies. It was um, or the standard in Poor's today. Poor's Index of Railroads. And it had detailed information every year on every railroad company in the country. And in this book, I made charts showing the tonnage of freight carried each year on that railroad and the number of passengers carried each year on that railroad. And those came from those Poor's manuals. And I knew they had them in Pittsburgh. They had part of them at WVU, and I found an interlibrary listing that said they had them in Pittsburgh at the Carnegie Library. And I went to the desk, and I filled out the sheet for all the different volumes I wanted, about 20 or 25 volumes, and all said, you don't have to bring them all down at once. The guy behind the desk said, oh, we only keep those 10 years, then we throw them away. I said, well, just humor me. Send the cards upstairs and see if anything comes down. A whole cartload of books came down. So it's a tiptoe job sometimes. You don't want to tell other people how to do their job, but sometimes you have to be persistent. You have to do it with a smile. You know, any archive, whether you're talking a county clerk's office or a library, if you go in with a demanding, bad attitude, you're not going to get that good of cooperation. I've told surveyors many times, every county clerk's office is like a little individual fiefdom. And there may be state rules, but there's their way of doing things. And if you want to get cooperation from them, you find out their way. And you do it their way. And it works out all right. Now what we have here, this is a detail from the Nine Sheet Map of Virginia. And uh, that's created from a TIFF to a, to a PDF to a JPEG and then cropped. I also did a little bit of cleaning up in the background. You can see it's not as yellow as the printed copy. But right here we have Charleston, we have the uh, salt works here, the burning springs, and things that are probably familiar to a lot of you in this area. This particular map was paid for in 1827 by the Virginia legislature. A fellow named Henry Boyd, and I may not be pronouncing that correctly. And it was the most comprehensive map of Virginia for many years. They knew by the 1850s that it contained some errors, and of course also some changes in county lines and those kinds of things and additional communities had been made. So they commissioned an update of the map. Unfortunately, uh, Mr. Buckholz, I believe, was the fellow that uh, did the revision. They told him to make all of the revisions possible to the map and corrections that he could, but he had to work with the original plates. Well, that kind of put a crimp on what he could do. But irregardless, it is a great resource and Every time I've shown that map anywhere in the state of West Virginia, people are always looking for their home territory on the map. And it's very good representational. Of course, you can tell we have the streams, but also, right here, this is Paint Creek coming in, and that Giles Fayette Canal Turnpike I'm working on is right there. Now, it's not shown on here in enough detail to put it onto the ground. But it is shown on there enough detail to know that one of the principal roads in that territory was there at that time. This is a detail of the other map that I have on the far end. Uh, some of you have probably heard of Jed Hotchkiss, Stonewall Jackson's topographer. Pretty much the most famous mapper of the Civil War. More by a long shot of his maps made it into the official records atlas than any other mappers during the war. This was his map of the Upper Taggart Valley, made from Jacob Conrad's memory. Now, I've been surveying for 30 years, and I've surveyed in a lot of the territory on that map, and it's pretty darn good. I would not even attempt to say that you could digitize that map and overlay it onto a modern map and have it fit, but it is an excellent representational map. And indeed, they even say in the... Uh, University of Virginia Library catalog that there's no scale, but I beg to differ. Oops, keep pushing the wrong button. See, right, uh, right here we have the number 17, and here we have the number 16. Those are the mile markers on the turnpike. 
That's the Huttonsville and Huntersville Turnpike. So you can certainly derive a scale for the map. Now this one, you know, in terms of interest to a historian, if you can find a comparable kind of map for the area you're looking for, you just have such a wonderful snapshot, you know, in this case of 1861. And I was particularly fascinated with this particular map. Right here, we have the Jacob Swadley house. I lived in that house until about 15 years ago. I'm probably going to end up getting it torn down pretty soon because it's, uh, it's going to do the job itself anyway. But it's still interesting to see it on there. Mark Riggleman, that's a log house that's still standing. It was actually Martin Riggleman. Well, Mark Riggleman was apparently the way the name was remembered by Jacob Conrad when he was working with Jed Hotchkiss. Which brings up an interesting point. In deeds or other records, the names you find are not necessarily exactly the way you expect them to be. They're not always necessarily spelled the way you expect them to be. Right here, it's showing two structures. As uh, William Fox, he owned 156 acres there. It's part of a 400-acre tract my uncle owns now. This map was made in 1861. There's a chimney on that property that one of my brothers has a stone from the chimney with 1856 chiseled in. So, Certainly one of those two houses. William Folks' grave is by itself on a little point up above that chimney. It's in a patch of hickory now, been woods for a long time. No doubt when he died in the early 1890s, it was all cleared off. It was overlooking his cabin site. I am absolutely convinced that he personally chose that spot. He's the only one buried there. It's a pretty nice little stone. But his name is spelled F-O-L-K-S, not F-O-X. I'm not sure which one is correct. You know, illiteracy was pretty common back then, and people didn't necessarily know how to spell their own name. The other fascinating thing in discovering this map, or I didn't discover it, I knew it was there for a long time, just never got the opportunity to get a copy. Stagger not. The entire area there, I had been told a number of times by old timers in the neighborhood over the years was Stagger Knob. But I was reluctant to use the name because I had never found any record anywhere in a deed or anything else that said Stagger Knob. And there it is on Jed Hotchkiss' map in 1861. So now we're having my nephew uh, make us up a, one of those vinyl signs to put on the hunting cabin up there, the Stagger Knob, Stagger Knob Lodge and Hunt Club. And, <laughs> Of course, Deer Camp being what Deer Camp is, you can see how the name Stagger Knob can sometimes be found appropriate for a Deer Camp. Now this is an unusual opportunity. I have already a number of times when I have shown this map in Randolph County had people just have a wonderful time looking at the map. Alright, I'll talk a little bit about plotting descriptions. Now, you know, as I say, I, I could really only kind of scratch the surface on it. But certainly, these are some equivalents that it's important to know. You know. A rod, a pole, or a perch, it's all 16.5 feet. Perch is usually only found in very old deeds. I, the latest use I found of perches was a lot of times in contracts for masonry con uh, construction on the turnpike roads. It was for so many perches of masonry, which would be a square rod. 16.5 by 16.5 by 16.5. Now the term chain, there's four poles in a full chain, or 66 feet. What I have here is a replica of a two-pole chain. The two-pole chain is more likely what was used, mostly in West Virginia. It's uh, 33 feet long. Let's see if I can do this without disaster. It didn't spread out all the way, but all of the old original land grants and deeds in West Virginia, this is how they measured the distances. There's 25 links in a pole. So each link is 0 0.66 feet, 7.92 inches. Those are oddball measurements, it seems like. But with four poles equaling a chain, 100 links in a chain, 80 poles is a quarter mile, or 20 chains, 320 poles is a mile, or 80 chains. This system was developed by surveyors 
at a very early date because it made the calculations for acreage easy. And also, in terms of distances, it gave something that you could work with. Now you can imagine measuring through the wilderness. You've got a front changement and a rear changement, and you're dragging this thing out there. Actually, most of the time, I believe the reason they used a two-pole chain is they could keep it suspended off the ground. Front chainment and a rear chainment. This is the kind of measuring tool that George Washington used. When he surveyed over in the northern neck of Virginia, the area around Romney <coughs> and uh, Moorefield and the entire eastern panhandle, there's been a lot of criticism in the last few years of George Washington's surveying work by people who don't understand the context. He would shoot the bearing on the line and go ahead to a prominent landmark and then have a chaining crew come behind him. And the chaining crew, the front chainman would carry what they called surveyor's pins or arrows, and whenever he got a little bump from the rear chainman, if they'd reached the last one of those, he would throw one of those in the ground. There's an expert from down in Georgia, a fellow named Milton Denny, who made this reproduction chain, who studied it a good bit, and he believes that a lot of that measuring was done with what they called bump and run. The rear chainman, when they reached a the point, would give a little bump, front chainman would throw the arrow in the ground, they'd barely break stride. The rear chainman would pick up the pin. When they'd gone through all of the pins, so they measured 10 chains, the, the uh, rear chainman, having the full complement of pins, would say, out. And then there would be a leather thong around the front chainman's neck, and he would move a little leather disc from one side to the other to keep track of the outs so that they had 10 chains. And, of course, then you could have various fractions of that. Now, the chainmen were not always necessarily very literate. And distance errors are not at all uncommon in old land grants and old deeds. As a matter of fact, they are more to be expected than other ones. There are times that in the later record there's a clear recognition that there may be a problem with the distance. <coughs> I worked with a piece of property one time on Golly River. I was working for one of the whitewater companies. And the one deed that was from the commissioner of school lands, which was the same as tax sale, except in this case, it was what they called waste and unappropriated <coughs> lands. Now this was clear up in the 1870s, joining grants, gave a bearing on the line, and then said 250 poles, perhaps much further. <laughs> they didn't know how long it was, but they wanted to make sure they got it all. And probably succeeded in that. The monuments themselves was what was more important. All right, area. Most of us are familiar with an acre, 43,650 square feet. It's also 160 poles. A pole, 16 and a half by 16 and a half, being 272 and a quarter. Now here's a nice, interesting little anomaly. Sometimes you'll see in a deed where it calls for so many acres, so many roofs, so many poles. A lot of people think rude is a misspelling of rod. It's not. Rude is 40 square poles, or a quarter of an acre. And I gave one example here, and I probably have a little more detailed example in your hand out there. You know, two acres, 135 poles. That's why sometimes when you look at land books, even still today, you would see that listed as two and 135, 160th acres. In the, in the digital world, that's 2.84 acres. Here. Yeah, I give you an example there in the handout on page three. One acre, three roots, and five poles. That's an acre plus three fourths of an acre plus five one hundred and sixtieths of an acre, or one point seven eight acres. The system seems a little crazy when you look at it now, but it was developed so you could do the math when you didn't have calculators or computers. You know, I'm old enough that when I first started surveying, we didn't have calculators with the functions on them. Sine, cosine, tangent, all those things that we make use of in trigonometry. Yeah, the trigonometry is one of those mysterious things to a lot of people. I always did okay in it. I never understood what it was for until I started surveying. So that was another one of those serendipitous things. Now the only reason I took trigonometry is because the guidance counselor said, with your good grades of math, you have to take trigonometry. Now there's logic for you. That's the kind of logic a ninth grader has a hard time grasping on too. 
but I took, I took the courses. And a lot of these measurements come down to being able to divide property into triangles or squares or rectangles when you're plotting it up to be able to figure the area or acreage. So it is no surprise that old deeds are often inaccurate with regard to the acreage. And in fact, that's why there's the phrase, any of you have probably seen, more or less. Now, of course, most people think more or less, that's just some way people steal from it. What it is really saying, what is more clearly expressed in some deeds, being a sale in gross and not by the acre. In other words, what you are buying is what is described in the bounds given in the deed. Whatever the acreage may turn out to be. And in fact, in West Virginia, more often than not, the acreage figures in the deeds are higher than the actual acreage that's there. I surveyed a piece of property for my grandparents 25 years ago. I had plotted the property up onto a topographic map and knew there was about 40 acres. They had bought it as 54 acres. The reason being, the original 300 acre tract had been split over the years. And each time, whatever was cut out of it, they deducted from the remainder. Theoretically, there was 54 acres left. What ended up happening is the last piece got all the shortage that was in the original tract. Now, my grandmother's reaction when I finished the survey said there's 40 acres. Well, who got our other 14 acres? <laughs> Nobody got it, Grandma. It was never there. It was just a mathematical fiction. And, and a good way to look at it is that the acreage figure in an old deed isn't really referring so much to the size of the tract as it is just a name the tract goes by. Like calling it the Smith Place. You're calling it the, the 50 acre piece. Or I guess in some of the agricultural ter terminology, the lower 40. It does not necessarily always translate into the actual acreage. Now, I thought this might be useful. You know, some of you may already be familiar that you can buy computer programs for as little as $100 that will plot deeds up. It's really just the same thing as using a protractor and a scale on a piece of graph paper. It's just that it's doing it in the computer instead of with the pencil. But I did this to explain what the quadrants and the bearings are about. The first issue is that we have 360 degrees in a circle, you know, whether you're talking around the earth or the dial of a compass, you know, either way. So you have four quadrants, each of which are 90 degrees. North is zero and south is zero. And then everything moves in relation to north and south. The example I've given here of north 55 west, you interpret it literally. That is 55 degrees west of north. That leaves us 35 degrees on the other side of the line there, just to kind of fill it in. That does equal 90, doesn't it? I did this in a hurry. You know, sometimes without the calculators, two and two isn't even four anymore, unless the calculator says so. So every bearing is really a combination. Now, in engineering school, they call that vectors, but it's north. 55 degrees to the west. The thing that a lot of times throws laymen, or in particular lawyers, you know, as surveyors, we can't help picking on lawyers, it just kind of goes with the territory. That's, uh, we have fun with it. Uh, I've also advised surveyors the same thing I tell a lot of other people. Best friend you can have is, is an attorney that is competent in the field where you need advice. So even though we pick on them sometimes, that doesn't mean we don't like them. We see South 55 East. That's a continuation of the same line. North 55 West or South 55 East, see that's not an absolute direction. What it depends is which way you're facing. If you're standing in the middle, right here, and you look in this direction, you're looking North 55 West. If you turn around on the same line, looking 180 degrees the other way, South 55 East. It's just two different phrases for the same line, depending on whether you're coming or going. And that's a real important difference because when you're plotting a deed up, a lot of times errors have been made, especially if a deed has been made from a combination of different sources. And maybe you've taken some bearings from one deed, some bearings from another deed, and you try to plot it up, 
it looks like a pile of spaghetti. It crosses back over on itself or has huge open areas. Bust, we refer to them as. Uh, some of the George Washington surveys have been criticized. A, a five-sided survey, if you calculate around the 300 acres, you come back around and he's 300 feet away from the beginning point on paper. That's actually pretty good work for that period of time. Uh, better than a lot of the land grant surveys of the time. Because he was not reporting on a mathematical calculation, he was reporting on his actual measurements in the field, which were subject to all kinds of errors. You know, you got the magnetic compass. If you're in an area with a lot of iron ore, the needle could be pulled off. And that's another reason that what's described as a straight line might not always be straight. Transcription errors are common. You ever look at some of those old deeds, the handwriting? It's obvious penmanship was not always the number one requirement for the job. Perhaps if the county clerk was your uncle, maybe you had an in. And every deed, when it was recorded, you had a handwritten deed. You took that usually to a notary public. They propped it up in front of them to make the new deed, copied it by hand, in cursive. Now that's that funny handwriting thing that most uh, kids don't understand anymore. Uh, I've heard stories of a kid coming home from school and said, the teacher says we're going to study cursive tomorrow. What's cursive? <laughs> the only answer I have for him is uh, that's the Bradley Hand ITC font in your uh, word process. <laughs> the, the closest answer I can give them to cursive. But that's copied by hand. Well, there's an opportunity for error right there. And now you're recording the deed. You take it to the courthouse. They prop it up in front of it. And they're sitting there, sloppy handwriting in front of them, they're copying it down, trying to make sure they follow along and get every line, don't omit anything, don't copy anything down incorrectly. Any of you ever try to copy anything down verbatim, manually? It's almost impossible not to make mistakes. That's why deeds are full of them. It's actually remarkable that they're as good as they are. Now another kind of misconception here at the bottom of our chart, I've given a very south 55 degrees, 15 minutes, or 15 minutes and 15 seconds east. A lot of times people read that as 55 degrees, 15 feet, and 15 inches. It's not feet and inches, it's minutes and seconds. And just like on the, the clock face, we have the 360 circle. So 15 minutes is 15 sixtieths of a degree, or a quarter of a degree. And in reality, that's all the closer a lot of the old original surveys were measured. A lot of our old deeds only give the bearing to the nearest uh, degree. And 15 seconds, 15 sixtieths again, that's a quarter of a minute. That's only 0 0.0625 degrees. You can see that a, a second is a very, very, very small part of a degree. And a, a thing we see happen a lot of times when somebody's copied an old deed, they'll copy it down. And it'll say south 55 degrees east. And particularly with lawyers, I've got to pick on them again, can't help it. It's just one of those things. They'll decide they're going to make it better. They'll give it greater precision. They'll say 55 degrees, zero minutes, zero seconds east. That's not at all what that says. They are implying a precision that was never there in the original measurement. All south 55 east really means is it's somewhere between 54 and a half degrees and 55 and a half degrees. And so when you carry it out to decimal places, you're creating the illusion of precision. But there is really no precision there. And uh, that's an important point to remember as a researcher. And you plot a deed up with a protractor and a scale or with a deed plotting program. You plot up 500 acres and it's busted two, three, four hundred feet. Don't worry about it. That's actually pretty good. Yeah, another factor that's involved is the difference between what we call slope and horizontal measurement. Now we convert all of our distances now to horizontal measurement. Our calculations will not close up otherwise. What horizontal measurement does is, is we convert things as though the world were a tabletop or a floor. Of course, I've said a lot of times with people in the real estate industry, you know, they'll draw You've got a plan of a piece of property and they'll draw all these squares on there and tell you how much money you can make splitting the property up because the whole world's flat on paper, not necessarily on the ground. The easiest demonstration I can think of, the difference between slope and horizontal, 
You know, here is a horizontal distance from the elbow to here. All right, that's pretty easy to understand. And here's the plumb line, the other arm. All right, you measure the distance on the slope. It doesn't get you there. The slope distance is longer than the horizontal distance. And it was very common in West Virginia and other mountainous areas for some surveyors to measure on the slope. It does not necessarily mean their work is bad. Uh, there was a family of county surveyors in Randolph County that over the years I have learned always measured on slope for about three generations. But if you can find one or two of their corners and start running out the deed calls measuring on slope, you'll find the evidence. That's one of those areas where a little local knowledge helps. So it's not necessarily bad. Of course, what it does do is it inflates the acreage because every line appears to be longer than it really is. And that's what leads to the misconception in a lot of cases that people have more acres than they really thought. And there's indications too, uh, one old surveyor from uh, Tucker County, he's no longer with us, I was honored to be one of, one of his pallbearers, but um, he always used to say, and his dad and granddad were surveyors, it's not necessarily always on the slope distance, but when you get to the slope distance, you better start looking, looking for the evidence. And of course, he always said too, that one reason that even after surveyors understood how to convert things to horizontal, that it was often still measured on slope, is because the farmer bought it by slope distance, he wanted to sell it the same way. He didn't want the acreage to get smaller between buying the property and selling the property, and that's kind of human nature there. Now, I do have this example in your handout. It's probably a little bit hard to read. But what I have done here is Forest Service Tract 87-1. Now, the Forest Service surveys are usually uh, pretty good surveys. Uh, not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but amongst the best work that was happening from World War I up until about 1940. In this particular deed, a number of calls talk about being either from the, the forks of dry run and then up dry run. And over here, now you'll see some of them with a question mark because they didn't repeat the call everywhere, but clearly intended to follow a road. Well, between the forks of dry run, dry run, the road, uh, over here we had a couple of more calls for a run. I was able to put those calls onto a topographic map. And what that does, it would allow me to go out there to figure out where those people lived that owned that property or the adjoining property. And of course, sometimes the names are in the adjoining deed, not necessarily just in the deed you're working with. And to talk a little bit about topographic maps, uh, I don't think I included this example, but uh, most of you probably recognize, uh, I don't think this building's on that map, but you can see the cat. Notice here, Greenbrier Street. There wasn't even really a street there. This topographic map was made from aerial photographs that were probably taken in the 1950s. And the things that are on there in purple are what are called photo revisions. That's where they've taken newer photographs and they've updated the maps. Of course, the interstate is a photo revision. This is some of those state office buildings over there that they're remodeling now. They show up here as a photo revision on this map so they were brand new and now they're trying to make them brand new all over again. But the key with a topographic map, the part that most people don't grasp, is that these individual lines are lines of equal elevation. Think of it like water in a bathtub. You raise the water level in the bathtub where you leave the bathtub ring is comparable to these contour lines. Uh, the heavier lines, in this case, are every 100 feet. The smaller lines are every 20 feet. In some places, they're uh, 40 feet. But in this particular map, they're 20. So here we have 1,000, 900, 800, and 700 feet in elevation. Generally speaking, where the contour lines are close together, it's steep ground. Where they're farther apart, it's fairly flat ground. I'm sure if you go to the top of that ridge, even though I've never been there, there's probably some houses up there by now, it's nice flat ground. And if you have some experience with a topographic map, it can kind of speak to you, and that does two things. 
For me as a surveyor, when I go to the field, I can see that there's some places I don't want to go. And sometimes, four times the distance is really the shortest way to get to where you want to be, if it's flat. And I, one old forester that I used to work with, some always said, uh, bad riding beats good walking, but uh, that's kind of another place to go with that. But I've included this one, of course this is uh, a readily available map, but that's the key. Lines of equal elevation. You know, the edge of the Kanawha River, that would be a contour line. A pond, a lake. I had an interesting experience a few years back. Um, I had a doe permit. Uh, they didn't have a doe season for a couple of years in Randolph County, so I went to uh, Stonewall Jackson Lake. And the topographic maps were drawn before the lake was there. And then the Delorme Topo Quads that I had a CD of for West Virginia, they had sketched in the map. But the interesting thing was, I mean, they had good data there, but when you zoomed in where they had sketched the lake, there were some places where the edge of the lake was crossing three or four contour lines. I knew that couldn't be. <laughs> Matter of fact, I wrote a little story on it for the surveyors uh, a magazine at the time that said, uh, even a redneck bass boat powered by white lightning couldn't send up enough wake to make the edge of the lake cross those contour lines. And actually, I created myself a perfectly good map by printing the maps without that layer on them, getting the spillway elevation, and just drawing that on the map. And that matched up what was on the ground. It's the kind of mistake that I'm sure would be embarrassing to the publisher of the map, but the kind of mistake that happens when you turn too much responsibility over to somebody that doesn't fully grasp what they're doing. And that's a danger no matter what kind of work you're doing. All right, I want to talk a little bit, and I could just go on and on on this subject. I'll try not to. I talked some about transcription errors. In some cases, there are simply omitted lines. Now, a lot of times, if you go on back in the records, you will find the correct bearing and distance on the line, or you will find the omitted line. I did one in Tucker County one time where if you start at this end, you're doing good, you're following along, and you know where you have to end up out here, and you don't end up there. Same thing from both ends. And it became apparent from the evidence on the ground that there was flat out a missing call. About 30 poles, nearly 500 feet. And what I did in that situation was I created the call. I mean, I had the whole record. The call was missing from everywhere. But at least I did know where the two ends of that series of calls were, and they were pretty well-recognized corners. And in this case, I was working for a lumber company, and the adjoining landowner was a lumber company, and they just both wanted to get these lines on the ground. They were perfectly happy to have me, in essence, manufacture the missing call and put those lines on the ground because they were trusting my judgment to make a decision as to where that boundary was likely intended to be. The precursor, to a certain extent, to the land grants and the land grant surveys, uh, I'll mention that the survey books are in a lot of counties. A lot of counties don't have a clue what you're talking about. Uh, the Northern Neck uh, grants, a lot of those, the plats are with the, uh, the grants online. Reversed bearings, just like I talked about the Northwest and the Southeast, very, very frequent kind of problem, and misspellings. The records are full of misspellings. When you're going back with the grantor and grantee indexes, do not say about a deed, oh no, that can't be him, he didn't spell his name that way. <laughs> Maybe he didn't know how he spelled his name. I looked at a deed one time in Randolph County, a piece of property was being sold by a man's heirs. 24 people signed the deed. 21 of them signed with an X. Do you think they knew how to spell their names? Now, I'll, I'll give them credit. There were times when maybe they couldn't spell anything else, but, they did. but even then, you know, don't let a spelling difference throw you. Uh, and and uh, let me pull something out here just a minute. I, I'm actually doing a, re a uh, seminar next week at the uh, Surveyors Convention in Morgantown on uh, Boundary Research in West Virginia and Record Analysis. Uh, I have the 29-page uh, handout of that with me. Um, and actually, if any of you want a copy, I'll sell you one for a, 
nominal price if you get together with me afterwards. But one of the things that I've done in that is there were a few names that I knew that had been changed. In particular, in the Eastern Panhandle, the name Bird, which is one that's familiar to most of us in West Virginia, in German was Vogel. So people came to this country with the name Vogel, and a generation or two later, they show up in the records as Bird. If you don't know that, you're lost trying to chase that back. Uh, another one is in southern West Virginia, there are a lot of people with the last name White. They're Italian. White is the translation of the Italian word Blanco, which was a family name. And I've compiled a whole list of them that, you know, some of them may have happened, most of them may never have happened, but it's interesting to, to look at the list. And uh, some of them you can see that uh, more than likely a lot of them have happened in one way or another. I mean, something as simple as from Spanish, lobo, to English, wolf. And some of them are very logical that way. Another thing that I have uh, in this particular document is a list of all the counties. When the county was formed, what other counties it was formed from, who the county was named for, and where the county seat is. Because it can be very important to understand those. And I've also got a, a lot of notes about different uh, tricks that you can use. Um, and different sources of information, including some examples of indexes, deed indexes. Of course, that's for a three and a half hour presentation <laughs> that we'll go into a little more detail with. And even still, you know, I've been at it 30 years. I'm still learning. I still have times that uh, I'm figuring things out. Road and stream names can often change. In Randolph County, Chenoweth Creek is a very commonly known area. When you get back to about 1795, Chenoweth Creek isn't in the records. It's Everman's Creek. And there's never any official thing that says we are now changing the name from Everman's Creek to Chenoweth Creek. It's just local knowledge. And that's the kind of local knowledge that you need sometimes. So, you know, those are some of the kinds of pitfalls that can happen. And to kind of sum up that aspect of things, don't always take too literally what a deed or a land grant says. Understand that there's errors in the records and that sorting out the causes of those errors can sometimes be an adventure. But just like any research, that adventure is part of what it's all about. Now, I think we've got uh, a little bit of time left here. Does anybody have any questions? Yes? I have a few quick questions. One of, what does a hub mean in a, in a survey? What is a hub? Well, actually, a hub is kind of a generic term for a wooden stake. Generally speaking, a hub is a kind of a fat wooden stake, maybe an inch and a half by an inch and a half. And when we use what's called a hub, a lot of times it's driven down flush with the ground. But in terms of a property corner, if they call for a hub, they're probably calling for a wooden stake. Okay. And it's no not going to be there. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a 30-acre piece in Wayne County that was bought in 1885. And then the following year, 1886, it says that delivered to a totally different person on the side of it. Why would that be? Because it's not the side, well, the buyer or the seller. And then- You mean the deed was delivered to a different person? Yes, and then he maintains it, as far as I know, it seems to be the same cause, until 1897, when he owns it and sells it to his son. But in between time, I've noticed that there's a different delivery on the deed, the deed itself. Well, all the deliver to on the deed means is that's the person that's going to get the original deed back. In other words, you would leave your original deed with the county clerk for them to copy it by hand, uh -huh. and then they would deliver it back to you. Today, generally speaking, they would mail it back to you. And just as say, sometimes today, it might be delivered to your mortgage company instead of to you. It might have been uh, the attorney for the buyer. Uh, it might have been another family member. There's not necessarily any logical connection. Okay. Usually, and you've probably need, noticed this, usually it's the grantee that it's delivered to. But okay. the person that's delivered to doesn't necessarily have any title interest or, or anything like that in the property. 
Are you familiar with the agricultural maps that were done, like around the 30s or 40s? Do there are some of those in some parts of the state. Um, actually, similar kinds of maps were done by some coal companies, uh, by some oil and gas companies, and they can be a valuable resource. As a surveyor, they can be helpful sometimes if we're having a hard time identifying adjoining tracks because they can give us a name to go to the records with. From a historian or genealogist perspective, they give you that little snapshot of the neighborhood, just you know, like the, uh, the Hotchkiss map over there. And even though they're not necessarily reliable in terms of the positions of the boundaries, in terms of the general information and the relationships of one tract with another tract, they're usually a pretty good source of information. Where do you get copies of that? I, it just depends upon the, the different counties. Uh, I, there is no central clearinghouse for maps like that. Um, I, I know that there was a uh, the area around, I believe, uh, Ritchie County, there was some surfaced a few years ago, and uh, they they were for sale, but th there's not any one source that you could go to for those. Well, I, I'm the president of the Genealogy Society of Huntington, and years ago, someone came to Charleston from out west and got one at something called the land office, so I don't know if that would be the... Well, now, the land office generally would be referring to the, the office that made the land grants, but that doesn't mean that the same term might not have been applied to something else. Um, you know, land office, for example, in, the, in terms of the, uh, the northern neck, the eastern panhandle, it would have been the Lord Fairfax's land office rather than the Commonwealth of Virginia's land office. It could have been a company land office, too. But it's a term that's used kind of generically sometimes. Yes? Uh, a couple of comments and then uh, a question. Uh, number one, you can find a lot of old names on the old turnpikes because when they came through, they usually bought dollar deeds from all the landowners. And if you look at the deeds between Malden and the courthouse, then there's probably about 20 names in there just on a on one deed. Well, actually, generally speaking, there's no deeds on the turnpikes because the right of way was acquired under the terms of the 1817 General Turnpike Law and it just specified that there would be a 60-foot wide right-of-way for the turnpike. Now, occasionally, if there was a particular key piece of property, they might have had, right. had a conveyance. But in most cases, there's no conveyance. Now, for later roads, there are conveyances of right-of-way. The other, uh, other thing, though, is that if they couldn't agree on a price, then they would appoint commissioners, and then there'd be a record, record in the circuit court records where a judge accepted or amended. Yes. If it reached the circuit court, the, the commissioner's uh, decision should be a matter of record. Um, now, of course, the turnpike field notes themselves, even though there weren't generally deeds made, those field notes show all the houses that they went by. Uh, in the one case, I've plotted up the Stan Parksburg turnpike notes uh, from top Allegheny and over to Virginia line, all the way to the Upshur County line, and at Rich Mountain. You know, where the farm was, the Battle of Rich Mountain in 1861. In 1845, when the turnpike was laid out, there was no farmhouse there. It's not on the notes. And he's been showing every other farmhouse. Now, you know, in that particular situation, the historians in that area have a pretty good handle on when that house was built anyway. But that can be a valuable tool for research. We know that house was built between 1845 and 1861. Go ahead. Okay, third quick thing, uh, should you talk about magnetic drift, uh, magnetic bearings, magnetic drift? Actually, that's, that's a good point. Nearly all old deeds, the bearings were measured by magnetic. And that's simply the direction a magnetic needle was pointing. A rule of thumb that we've used for many years in uh, the part of West Virginia that I'm from is that the magnetic bearing changes about one degree every 20 years. We had a spell for a few years where that accelerated, it changed a degree in about 10 years, and then reverted back to changing about a degree every 20 years. It cannot be predicted, it can be measured after it occurs. The declination in Randolph County, where I am now, uh, magnetic north is about 10 degrees or nearly 10 degrees to the west of true north. Some places in the Midwest, the compass needle is as much as 30 degrees off of true north. Now, true north is astronomic north, just in the simplest terms, to the North Pole or the North Star. But magnetic north is simply pointing to the center of attraction 
that's floating around up there in northern Canada, apparently the Arctic, and it's changing constantly. It confuses people a lot of times because they'll look at a deed and they'll say, well, they've changed the bearings. They didn't really change the bearings. And of course, you have to explain a lot of times that as the compass needle is changing, it doesn't mean the line is changing on the ground. It just means that when you've lined up on that line, the needle of the compass is pointing in a slightly different direction. Now today, we're moving away from that a great deal with what we call grid north, you know, GPS grids, state plane coordinates, latitudes and longitudes, uh, and some surveys, of course, are, are still done on the uh, true north or the astronomic meridian. Of course, one thing that some people don't understand, if you have two true north lines that are a mile away from each other, those lines aren't parallel they converge. because they're going to converge at the North Pole. Now, the convergence of two lines a mile apart is not going to be much in the context of, of a piece of property, but in the overall context, you know, that, that goes to the, the things like the Mercator projection where the Arctic and the Antarctic look huge because they're trying to break the whole world into a grid, and a globe does not well adapt itself to that. Magnetic bearings will never lose their importance in the terms of surveying or interpreting on surveys because they give us a snapshot of what the magnetic bearing would have been then. And there are what are called isogonic tables. You can find them online. You can enter a latitude and longitude and find out what the magnetic declination should have been at a particular time, calculate the difference theoretically to now, and know about how much difference the magnetic bearing should be. A friend of mine from Upshur County has an old, obviously homemade surveyor's compass, and uh, I suggested to him that we take it to the True North Line in Randolph County, or I don't, I don't think there is one in uh, in Upshur County, but observe what the the bearing reads on that line, because more than likely, the man that made that compass, he was a country surveyor, and probably aligned his needle with the North Star. So if we would put that on a true north line now and see how far off a true north it is, it would give us a reasonable estimate of the age of that compass. Not like carbon dating or anything like that, but it uh, would probably put us within 10 or 20 years of the origin of that compass. Right here. That thing you run into is, when I bought my property, I bought it under a GI Bill. So it had to have a government approved survey of it. Then later on I decided I was going to fence it. Well, the fence company says we can't put it on the line. We have to put it three inches inside your line so that you don't get somebody else's property, an inch and a half of their property with the fence pole. And I said, that's silly to me. He said, yeah, it is. He said, but he said, you're going to have to get a survey. So fortunately at the time there was a company put the water line in. They had uh, uh, ran over one of my markers on my property. I went down and I explained to the engineer. I said, you just ran over a government place survey marker. And I strongly suggest you put it back where it was before I see you out and sell my property. And uh, they decided their D9 cap was worth a little bit more than surveying my property. So then they had to survey it. And I found out then that the government places, or the state places, certain survey markers in certain tracts of land that have been split up as a track mark or a, a separate location. You know, I've seen out west on the June, what are called, June, June Disney, something. Disney. Well, there's not an overall system for that. It just depends upon the, the, the partitioning in a particular area. There's no official uh, in what in the meets and bounds states, right. you know, the, the colonial states, there's no official government boundary markers to work for. Yeah. Um, and, of course, it is illegal to disturb a property corner. Now, what we do have is we have triangulation marks a lot of times on ridges, but that's part of the triangulation network that was used to set up the original geodetic control all over the country. Uh, and, you know, similar things, I, I worked on a project one time where they put in a sewer line, and they put it in an alley, and they knocked the back corners out of everybody's lots. And they said, oh, don't worry, we put them back. Well, we surveyed down through there. Some of them they had within a foot, some of them two feet. You know, I, I guess they just went down through, yeah, that looks like about where it was, and uh, that wasn't too popular with the landowners. I guess we have time maybe for one more. Have you run across the 
Kentucky Trace and anything you've been doing. Not the it Kentucky the Trace. Are you talking about a road or? No, it's just a reference to the Kentucky Trace. It was a trace that ran, I think, from somewhere up in Greenbrier or somewhere else, all the way across the Kentucky Well, Trace is generally considered to be a road. Um, I'm not familiar with that one, but it would be logical that there would have been a route from the Greenbrier Valley over to the Kentucky country. Um, you know, the one famous one is still called, goes by the names of the Natchez Trace, and the origin of the term trace is really just a path or a trail. Um, I think we're supposed to be out of here in about 10 minutes. But... Um, did you ever hear of the Gallatin line? Uh, actually, Albert Gallatin was an, an early uh, wheeler dealer. Uh, he had hundreds of thousands of acres in West Virginia. So there could be many, many lines in West Virginia referred to as the Gallatin line. Um, one thing that happened with the people that got those land grants, uh, it looks like you know, they were just rich people getting these huge grants of land, but a lot of them were people that either the colony of Virginia or various other different entities owed a lot of money to. They helped finance the revolution. Henry Banks is a name that you'll see just page after page in Sims Index. He was a merchant in Richmond. And after a while he realized, I ain't going to get my money. They will give me land. Maybe it ain't worth much, but it's something. And so there's a lot of banks lines. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the uh, Gallatin, I think that when I talked about that uh, Harrison and Greenbrier County line, uh, some of the grants we looked at along it were grants that went to uh, Gallatin. And I believe he had a partner whose last name was Savory, S-A-V-O-R-Y. Um, but that's not specifically any just if one line, although in a given neighborhood, probably would tend to be a fairly well-known line. Uh, he got around because the... Yeah, we got, we, they got to get things closed up here. The house at Greenbottom is Albert Gallatin Jenkins. And Albert Gallatin was Thomas Jefferson's Secretary of the Treasury. And he was the one that initiated the idea of the National Road from, from Baltimore to the Ohio River. Yeah. It's, you know, research keeps kind of crossing in and on and back around itself. That's one of the wonderful things about doing it. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I'm Joel. Uh, if anybody wants a copy of the Gandhi, I have it up here. Or if you want a, a copy of that 30-page uh, handout from land surveyors, I have that.